Hello and welcome to Fukushima Daiichi and the Ocean, 10 years of study and insight. I'm Miles O'Brien and I will be your host. So where were you 10 years ago this next week, 3-11-11? I'm sure all of you have a ready answer. The Great Tohoku Earthquake is one of those events etched in stone in our collective memories. But of course, that was just the beginning of the story and 10 years later, it is still unfolding. So let's look back, let's assess the present, and let's see what the next 10 years may hold with some scientific experts who know the story well. We'll also spend some time talking about how we should talk about Fukushima and its environmental impact. But before we go any further, let's pause and reflect for a few moments to acknowledge the terrible loss of life as a result of the devastating earthquake and the tsunami. May they rest in peace. <clears throat> Before we begin, some tips on how you can optimize your experience with us on Zoom. At the end of the program, our panelists will be taking questions from all of you. If you have a question, please use the Q&A button on your Zoom screen and type your question in the window that appears. Now, you may be more familiar with the chat function in Zoom, but for tonight, please use the Q&A function instead. We expect a lot of questions so I apologize if we don't get to yours while we are live. You can ask questions at any time, starting now. You should also see a globe icon at the bottom of your screen. If you click that, you can choose between Japanese and English translations. After you select the language you would like to hear, you should click on the globe icon again and select mute original audio. This will allow you to hear only the language you selected. Finally, I want to remind you that in addition to this event, there is a virtual poster session everyone is invited to. Poster sessions are often part of scientific conferences where scientists share their most recent research. You can find the virtual poster session by going to the URL on the screen and clicking the link at the top of the page. You'll find 40 posters, each of which includes audio in Japanese and English describing the research. I'm a journalist and filmmaker who focuses on science and technology. The Tohoku earthquake and the devastation it brought touched on several aspects of my beat, earthquakes and tsunamis, how to predict them, and nuclear power, how it works, how it doesn't. My first reporting trip to Japan after the earthquake was in July of 2011. Tokyo, as usual, was hot but the thermostats were set high and the lights were dimmed to conserve energy. Japan's big bet on nuclear power was already over, a big loss in many ways, uh, but that was just for starters. On my way to the exclusion zone, I realized the full scope and depth of the disaster. Coastal communities were leveled for hundreds of miles. People were sifting through the wreckage, looking for whatever might've been left of their belongings. The breadth and depth of it is really impossible to convey in a film or on television. And then in the exclusion zone, I traveled with an elderly couple to a, a home about a kilometer from the plant that had been in his family for 500 years, 500 years. With cameras rolling, their stoic Japanese facade crumbled in tears and heaving sobs. They were never coming home, and that was the moment that it hit them. Our keynoter today knows this pain firsthand and has dedicated much of her talent and energy <clears throat> to helping those affected get back on their feet. She launched the Japanese Disaster Relief Fund. Her efforts helped raise millions for the recovery in the Tohoku region of Japan. And they were recognized by Emperor Akihito, who gave her the Order of the Rising Sun, one of the highest Japanese orders conferred on civilians. It's an honor to hear from Atsuko Toku Fish.
。オブライアンさん、ご紹介どうもありがとうございます。オブライアンさん、and then the uh, uh, thank you very much for your introduction。and I'm so pleased to have the participation of so many people here。and then so that、uh, Ruth Hall、the、um, whole Oceanographic Institute。Uh, and they have uh, uh, made a wonderful research in the last 10 years. I'm really looking forward to the result. I'm not a specialist of the ocean study, but I would like to touch up on my own experience after the disaster, earthquake, and some of the lessons I learned. On the next day after the earthquake or disaster,、uh, on the 12th of March 2011 in Boston, I Decided to establish this、uh, emergency support fund in Boston to support the people in Tohoku. That is to collect a、uh, fund and donation. Two years later, that、uh, it has achieved this、uh, 600 million yen worth of economic effect, I believe. I and my husband、uh, organized and run a small scale family foundation. In 2011, the, the、uh, disaster was reported in Boston. And then we were so shocked and so moved by that. And right after that, because、uh, a friend of mine、uh, offered to donate one million yen, I,、uh, we also personally donated、uh, 10 million yen fund from our foundation. So、uh, 11 million yen was the basis starting fund. And some people donated a high level of 1 million yen, or some people made a small level of the donation after、uh, successfully selling lemonade and、uh, collected $20. Many people、uh, contributed greatly. And our foundation organized a concert and ballet performances in order to raise funds. So, in order to give this、uh, emergency relief, it was、uh, just a two year short period of time. But、uh, in total, We have collected 100 million yen of、uh, donation money, and all the expenses were borne by our foundation. And all the donated money、uh, was、uh, contributed to the、uh, relief and assistance to Tohoku and Tohoku people. First,、uh, we have organized this、uh, medical team、uh, who live in、uh, Boston, the Japanese doctors, nurses, and the pharmacists. So,、uh, this、uh, medical team was already dispatched to Fukushima at the end of March. And then at the same time, this variable,、uh, the donation money, should be utilized effectively to do that. that and we should be accountable to the, all the donors. Therefore, we needed to know the needs of this、uh, disaster struck area. However, I think the most important thing is to really know and I, I see the needs of the area. With my own eyes. So, despite the opposition and concern by my family members, three weeks later, I already headed to Tohoku. I arrived at the Narita airport, and there was nobody at the airport. And it was so quiet. I really noticed that the things have become so abnormal after disaster. All the transportation network and the roads were closed to Tohoku. So, I、uh, Finally, hitched the,、uh, the cargo truck and then they let me、uh, ride on the load carrying platform to reach Fukushima. So, the medical team dispatched from Boston already、uh, was active at the shelter for the evacuees in Fukushima, the SOMA, and the existence of this medical doctor really gave them the healthcare support, but、uh, they gave the so called mental support to the people there. So, the early dispatch of this med relief medical team was quite useful, I believe. That、uh, after Fukushima, we went to Iwate Prefecture, the、uh, Ofunato area, which was most seriously damaged. Another, uh, the uh, NPO in Boston,、uh, to give assistance. They are specialized in the disaster struck site. So, they are named All Hands. And those are the relief team members already active in、uh, Ofunato port and area. So, We, I observed the fishing port in Ofunato as well as how the rubbers and debris were cleaned up. The road was not reconstructed. There was no transportation means to reach Ofunato port. But fortunately, I met Mr. Abbott of the US Embassy, and uh, uh, he was kind enough to offer a ride to uh, the, the, there from Fukushima. So, together with all these American colleagues, we、uh, rode toward north. 
uh, the the road was so dark, uh, lit road. It was uh, such a big adventure, but without being able to see the field and the real thing, uh, you know, I had to see it. So I didn't feel s scared at all. So these young volunteers from the USA, I worked together with them to clean up debris. I remember that, that hard work of cleanup. So there were three lessons there. So let me uh, give you an idea of what I learned. The first one is that uh, at the disaster struck area, we implemented this uh, research of the needs. Uh, locally, naturally, I was outsider. And of course, my name had uh, the American name and the people got a bit uh, uh, they alarmed and they didn't open up uh, to me. I visited many, many times and finally, they recognized the, uh, the good work that we were cleaning up the rubbles and debris. They thanked us and we finally gained the trust of the local residents. So based upon that trust and confidence-based relation that uh, we got the information through the organization people, I identified the exact need of that uh, area. So during that two years of this uh, activity, I went to Tohoku many times. I collected the variable fund from the, uh, the donors in Boston. And I think we believe that the money was spent wisely and effectively. If you are interested in, uh, there's a chat. It's entitled this uh, report of this uh, Boston fund. So uh, that's attached uh, in here. So please refer to this chat. However, there's no uh, the English version, uh, the, the Japanese version rather, it's only in English. Now the Corona pandemic struck uh, the USA and the world. And the trust-based philanthropy uh, has become the important uh, word in the USA. And people are paying attention to this word, trust-based philanthropy. Uh, we've been engaged in this kind of activity already 10 years because we implemented such activity already in Tohoku 10 years ago. The second lesson I learned is the independent and voluntary activities of those women uh, in the disaster struck area. And they grew so much in the last 10 years. Right after the disaster, they faced many difficulties. Those women knew the exact need in the field, but their voices were never reached. This uh, official organization for reconstruction, sometimes their voices were ignored, but they established their own NPOs and voluntarily they started to provide uh, support needed. So they know very well about the social issues and challenges. And the experts, they identified the need in the local area and they were patient and perseverance and uh, was there. And then they successfully raised the fund and then implemented policies and supported the policy at the same time. So in Japan, we have had this bad uh, uh, prejudice uh, and uh, so they realized the importance of the society, which is equal without discrimination. They advocated for the human rights for the people, and they led this uh, uh, transformation of the Japanese society in the last decade. And I think their activities are, are quite influential uh, during this Corona pandemic as well. These women are really uh, the uh, they will shoulder the future of Tohoku destiny and together with the government and then the companies, those women are the quite the powerful leaders who lead Japan in the future. The third lesson or the third point I'd like to raise is this uh, unforgettable landscape scenery. I saw when we were heading toward north, towards Tohoku from the car, I saw cherry blossoms after the tsunami. Everything was lost, destroyed, and only the, the black colored sand was observed al along the coast. But on the other side of that this mountainside, we saw the cherry blossoms in full bloom, announcing the spring has come. So tsunami has taken away the lives of people and the houses, but cherry blossoms bloom still every spring as if nothing had happened. And they uh, let us see these beautiful cherry blossoms. That experience, let me recognize that in the last 75 years, during the post-war period, Japan only paid attention to economic growth. We did not pay enough attention to the nature. Japan is a tiny country surrounded by the sea and the mountains, and we cannot survive and live without the harmony with nature. And we should never ever forget such a lesson. And that was a strong impression of me. Thank you very much for your attention.
Thank you so much, Atsuko, and we appreciate all of your efforts. Uh, first question for you, what urged you to go to Tohoku uh, right after the disaster? So actually, I wanted to see the Gemba, the field, with my own eyes to understand the exact need. Otherwise, you cannot wisely and effectively use the donated fund. A question coming from the audience along those lines. Do you know how much Japanese philanthropy reached Tohoku? Domestic Japanese NPOs in the Japanese charity organizations? Well, specifically, I don't know the exact amount of the older donation that reached Tohoku. Why do you think your trust based philanthropy is so important? Uh, well, trust-based philanthropy is that uh, you understand the need, uh, exact need of the field. Otherwise, you'll be sort of bound by the just logic and theory. And even though you get the donation money, you can effectively use it. Like uh, in the emergency situation, like today, they're under the corona pandemic. What kind of people were uh, suffering with what, what kind of need? Unless you know what's happening in the field, uh, uh, then uh, and with the, that knowledge uh, that your donation money will be used uh, effectively. Thank you so much, Ms. Fish. We appreciate your time and all of your Thank efforts you. to help people. We really appreciate it. Now let's take a step back and begin at the beginning. What really happened at Fukushima? The sequence of events is dramatic, to say the least. Three meltdowns, three hydrogen explosions, the venting of radionuclides into the air, and of course, the release of lots of very hot water. Significant amounts of radionuclides made their way into the Pacific through direct discharge and atmospheric deposition. But the radiation levels dropped very quickly. We know this thanks in large part to our next speaker who organized and led several research expeditions in coastal waters off Fukushima. He is currently a professor at the Tokyo University of Marine Science and Technology. Please welcome Dr. Jota Kanda. Brian, thank you very much. And good evening, everyone. Welcome to this session. I am Kanda of this uh, university. Uh, and uh, what I would like to first touch upon what happened in the accident of Fukushima 10 years ago. First, I will briefly review that uh, power plant and then they talk about the earthquake and tsunami and the damage on the reactor units and the release of radionuclides. The Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant has uh, six reactors from unit one to six. Unit one went into operation in March 1971. Uh, so oh, that was about uh, uh, 50 years ago. The place was originally a wide plateau along the coast at an altitude of about 30 meters high. And it was like a coast, uh, uh, somewhat like a cliff. A power plant was built by excavating the plane down to about 10 meters above sea level. Although the tsunami was expected, the maximum water level was estimated to be only 6.1 meters. This has some uh, grave consequences later. 10 years ago, at 1446 uh, on March the 11th, there was an earthquake which exceeded magnitude 9 uh, according to Richter's scale, it is one of the largest earthquakes in the world to date. In particular, many people were killed in the subsequent tsunami. I have shown some of the uh, casualties caused by the tsunami that occurred in Japan in the past. Meanwhile, the, uh, this was the maybe the uh, greatest earthquake Meanwhile, the more than 200,000 people were killed in 2004 uh, in the Indian Ocean tsunami. We can see the devastating effect of tsunami. 
50 minutes after the quake at around 337, the tsunami reached the power plant. The water level exceeded 10 or 50 meters. The emergency generators and batteries were flooded and lost. And at the power plant, the power supply was cut off due to the earthquake. So the fission reaction was immediately stopped and the water supply by the emergency generator started. Nuclear fuel contains various radioactive substances. Even if the fission reaction stops, the radioactive material continues to generate heat. So you have to keep cooling uh, uh, by water for quite a long period. If the emergency power is lost, cooling water cannot be supplied and the heat will cause more and more water to be lost. The temperature of the fuel will continue to rise when metal reacts with water at high temperatures, hydrogen gas is generated. If the temperature rises further, the nuclear fuel will melt, causing core meltdown. The melted fuel will damage the vessels. Hydrogen gas leaks from the there, and eventually it reacts with oxygen in there and causes a hydrogen explosion. In Fukushima, units one to four had an accident. Unit one lost all emergency power and melted down as early as uh, midnight of March the 11th there were, because of the uh, water supply cut. And hydrogen explosion occurred in the afternoon of the following day. In, in Unit 2, one uh, emergency system supplied uh, water without uh, the uh, using electricity. However, the system stopped on March 14th and meltdown occurred at midnight. Only the Unit 2 escaped the hydrogen explosion. However, at Unit 3, the emergency battery survived the tsunami and cooling continued by this electricity. However, the electricity in the battery was exhausted on the next day. The meltdown occurred in the night of March 13th and the hydrogen exploded on March the 14th. At Unit 4, nuclear fuel had been removed from the reactor during regular maintenance. However, the hydrogen generated at the Unit 3 flowed into the building, causing a hydrogen explosion in the early morning of the March the 15th. So the, uh, the unit five and six uh, survived. With these damages to the reactors, radio radionuclides were released. There are various radionuclides in the reactor, mostly volatile and water soluble elements were leaked. In the following talks, uh, CCM-137 will frequently appear. CCM-137 has a longer life period and large amount of this was released. Iodine-131 and other substances have a much shorter lifetime. Although strontium and tritium have a relatively long life period, the le release was much smaller than cesium. The elements leak from the damaged reactors and are released into the atmosphere. In order to lower the pressure inside the vessel, they performed an operation called vent to release the gas. This also caused radionuclide released into the atmosphere. They also tried to supply water to cool the reactor, but the water leaked and accumulated underground. Part of this contaminated water leaked into the sea. This is the direct discharge. As shown in this slide, the substances released into the atmosphere will eventually fall out on land and sea. Therefore, radionuclides were brought to the sea by two ways, two pathways, one from atmosphere disposition and the other from the direct discharge at the peak uh, of uh, early April. So release to the atmosphere was mainly in March and the direct discharge peaked at the beginning of April and the last 10 years of research result uh, revealed all this. So this figure shows how CC-137 released to the atmosphere throughout March. Radioactivity is indicated by Peta Becquerel, 10 to the 15th Becquerel. It is constructed by back calculation with atmosphere dispersion models fairly in detail. The estimated release corresponds well to events such as hydrogen explosion bends and unexplained pressure drop. The similar estimates are possible for direct discharge into the ocean. However, the observation data is scarce in the sea and the detailed process cannot be reconstructed as shown in this, uh, like the uh, shown in this red line here. The amount of the discharge can also be calculated from the radioactivity at the harbor of the plant as well. The 
the one I calculated and the ones calculated by the other research uh, search are compared and like uh, uh, shown in blue and green lines here. The amount of cesium-137 released are shown in the unit of beta background and others are also shown here. The amount directly discharged in the Fukushima accident is estimated to be three to six peta becquerels uh, shown in green color in the bar. The amount uh, deposited from atmosphere onto the sea is 12 to 15 shown in blue color. The color, the total amount is 18 to 27, including the amount that has fallen on the land, which is shown in white. There is a place called the Sheller Field in the UK, where the many nuclear facilities uh, are there, and including fewer reprocessing uh, uh, facilities are located. The amount released from 1951 to 1992 was 41 peta becquerel, but uh, uh, in 1975, the peak was uh, 5.2 uh, becquerel, close to the Fukushima value. But it seems a lot more than Fukushima, but keep in mind that this is 40 years of discharge. In Fukushima, most of the discharge occurred in a few weeks. Much larger amount was released in a shorter period. In the well-known 1986 Chernobyl accident, the power plant was located in uh, the uh, con center of the continent and 15 to 20 out of the total emission of the 85 peta becquerels went to the ocean via the atmosphere. In the atmospheric nuclear tests, the uh, 950 peta becquerels of cesium-137 was released worldwide in total, and of that, over 600 was transferred to the sea. Returning to Fukushima, the reactors of Unit 1 to 3 had a total of 700 peta becquerels of cesium-137. Of these, 140 peta uh, Backward, about 20% went into the contaminated water beneath the power plant building in April and May. And only three to six of them have gone into the sea. This uh, uh, contaminated water was pumped up and uh, reused after treatment. And the most of the cesium and other uh, materials have now been removed. This is the last slide. The radioactive materials are brought to the sea in several different ways. As shown here, in the sea, they were transported along with seawater, and some went into the bottom sediment, as shown in this figure. They are also transferred to the marine organisms. And other panelists after this will talk about that as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Kanda. We appreciate uh, all of your efforts uh, in the scientific realm, trying to understand all of this. A question for you, uh, how much has this event provided an opportunity for researchers to better understand how radionuclides are spread throughout the environment and into the sea? Thank you for your question. It's a new kind of unprecedented type of accident because in a short period of time, a large quantity uh, was released into the one region and then the spread of the contaminants was unprecedented. We have gained and collected so much new findings. And of course, it went to the sea and uh, uh, the onshore radioactive substances and then, and so, so it went through the groundwater and to the river and eventually went to the ocean. And so we had a clear understanding now about the mechanism of spread. We have a question from the audience from David. <clears throat> Did the ice wall prevent radioactive water from going into the ocean? Ice wall is, uh, and the purpose of an ice wall was that uh, 
to prevent the leakage of the radioactive materials. But the major the purpose is to prevent the inflow of this uh, groundwater because there was an increasing amount of this uh, contaminated water under this reactor building. As to its efficacy or effectiveness, there are pros and cons about it. There was some effect thanks to that ice wall. Yes, but uh, they excavated a new uh, well and then lower the groundwater level, which was more effective. Some people say the ice wall was effective to only to a certain extent as to the leakage of a radioactive material. I don't know, frankly speaking, how effective it was. The ocean data could not really demonstrate how the ice wall was uh, ever effective or not. Thank you, Professor Kanda. We'll have some more questions for you uh, when we get to the panel section of our program. Our next scientific presenter was also in the waters off Fukushima not long after the meltdowns, trying to get some data. He has followed the cesium-137, 134, and other radionuclides uh, ever since. You know, reporters say all the time, follow the money. Ken Bissler always follows the cesium. He cut his teeth doing research on the impacts of atmospheric weapons testing and the Chernobyl meltdown on the Black Sea. He has been a strong advocate for gathering the essential data researchers need to understand the spread of radionuclides and their potential impact. In fact, when the US government showed no interest in doing it, he recruited an army of volunteers to gather samples on the west coast of the US. 10 years later, he has a very clear picture of how the cesium flows, and among other things, some rivers run through it. Please welcome Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution senior scientist, Ken Bissler. Thank you, Miles, for that introduction and welcome everyone. My name is Ken Bissler. I'm a senior scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution. I'm gonna to talk to you about the consequences to the ocean of the release of radioactivity from Fukushima Daiichi. I'm gonna do that by quickly going through four topics, basically the radioactivity in seawater that was released and how it was transported. I'll talk briefly about radioactivity on the seafloor sediments. We'll think about ongoing sources from rivers and groundwater and also about future concerns, such as radioactivity still contained in thousands of tanks at the reactor site. So let's get right to it. We're gonna talk about radioactivity in seawater. And this graph we're gonna spend a little time on, it shows radioactivity levels of cesium-137, a radioactive form of cesium, units of becquerels per cubic meters, a decay of n per second, a very small amount of radioactivity in a big amount of water, and these are taken as close as possible to Fukushima Daiichi. So these are the highest numbers that were observed in 2011 and out here to 2020. We have to use this logarithmic scale to cover the whole range from over tens of millions down here to one or two. And that's important because as we compare Fukushima Daiichi, this unprecedented accident, the levels here over 50 million are much higher that even after Chernobyl in the ocean work I did in the Black Sea or prior to the accident off the coast of Japan and in every ocean, and people don't fully appreciate, but everywhere in the world, there's a small amount of cesium-137 in the ocean left over from the atmospheric nuclear weapons testing that peaked in the 1960s. So we always have some cesium. So the question is how much more was added and what are those trends? So if we look a little more closely, we see a very rapid decrease in the first couple of months. That's largely due to heroic efforts at the reactor site to plug the leaks, to reduce the direct discharge, that water discharge of cesium to the ocean. It kind of slows down. We actually took samples off the coastline in June, right at the point where it's going from this rapid decrease to a slower change, where it reached in four years to a level of 1,000 becquerel per cubic meter. And I'll explain in the next slide why that level is important. But today it's kind of flattened out here at a number somewhat higher than 100. Of course, there's variability around these averages, but basically we're at a point today where the concentration in the ocean closest to the reactor is still higher than it was before the accident. Therefore, we know there must still be an ongoing source today. And by the end of this talk, I hope to tell you about how big that is relative to 2011 releases. But the big question is, should I be concerned? How do these cesium levels compare to other health standards? And here, 
I put the drinking water standard for Japan, 10,000 in these units of becquerels per cubic meter. It's somewhat arbitrary because we don't drink ocean water, but we got below that pretty quickly within the several months after the accident. More importantly, I think, and I don't work for a government lab, I just look at the data of at what level would cesium have to be to cause direct harm to marine life, so mortality, reproductive effects. And we got out of this red zone in the first couple of months. That's a number around 1 million becquerels per cubic meter. We then entered for several years down to about 1,000 becquerel per cubic meter, what I call it the yellow zone. That's when we're less concerned about direct harm to marine life, but human consumers of seafood. As you'll hear in the next panel's talk, if levels of cesium are above 1,000 in the ocean, they are above about 100 becquerel per kilogram, the standard set in Japan for seafood consumption. So during this period, we, Japan shut down appropriately fisheries so people were not being uh, exposed or internalizing fish at levels above concern. And today, we're basically in this green zone where I'm not concerned, certainly, about consumption generally of seafood, of swimming, sailing, surfing, because those doses are quite small. And we've gotten into area where, even though it still is elevated, a very, very small risk. And notice that these boundaries are a little fuzzy. This would depend on the type of marine organism, adults and children, but on this scale, I think this holds up pretty well. It's one good way to think about this accident. So where does the cesium go in this case once it gets into the ocean? That was just along the coastline. I love this animation. It just, I just love the ocean currents and their complexity and how they move through here. There's Japan, I'm sure you'll recognize. And these white lines are showing you the Kurashio current moving water very rapidly from the coast of Japan, east across the Pacific. And just north of the Kurashio is the site of the reactor accident. So any liquid releases would be carried by these currents quickly across the Pacific. What you might not realize is that the people on the west coast of North America were also concerned because they had seen the releases and knew it was coming their way. So in about 2013, 2014, we launched a campaign to take measurements along our coastline. The darker colors indicate more cesium directly attributable to the release from Japan. So we could measure it, but look at these numbers. They only go up to here, a scale of eight, not thousands, not millions, very small levels. And these light blue locations or light blue circles are samples that we could not detect any Fukushima-derived cesium along the West Coast. What was kind of interesting to me is we really didn't have a, a huge government federal interest in making these measurements. So I enlisted through a crowd-funded campaign, our radioactive ocean uh, classrooms, teachers, uh, families, servers to collect these samples for us and send them to Woods Hole while using very sensitive equipment. We could analyze even these very low levels. And to give you some feeling, if the level of cesium is about 10 becquerels per cubic meter in the ocean, you could swim every single day in that ocean for an entire year. And the additional dose is not zero, but we've got a thousand times less than, smaller than a single dental x-ray. So these levels really are not of concern, but we can measure them as scientists. So let's quickly move on to the seafloor sediment and what happens there. Well, a small fraction, in this case of cesium-137, does accumulate on the bottom sediments. These numbers have been going down over time. Again, these were taken right off of Fukushima Daiichi, about a factor of five decrease between 2011 and 2018, 2019. A lot of variation. You go back, you never see quite the same uh, sand. The clay content differs. And what's happening, why it's decreasing, is because while it lands on the surface, organisms like starfish and sea urchins and others will mix that down into sediment that's not contaminated. So this is a bioturbation, a decrease due to the organisms that live there. Not as quickly as what happens in the ocean, but definitely decreasing over time. So what about other ongoing sources? You saw earlier that fallout also landed on land in Japan. And so the colors here are the deposition map of cesium and other isotopes. And you see down in the lower right, Fukushima Daiichi on this map and the dark red areas with the heaviest contamination. There's several small rivers, these are just a few of them that drain these areas. So to first order, what you'd expect is the amount of cesium stay in a river would depend upon the watershed 
where it's draining with higher levels in the immediate vicinity of the reactor. Another thing to note is that cesium itself attaches to soil particles because of the clay and organic content. And so it's coming down associated with the rivers, not with the water, but with the particles that they carry. So in this case, it's really coming down with heavy rain events like typhoons or with spring snow melt. And so that's how it's actually moving as particles down these rivers. And the last point in terms of the rivers and the many studies that have been made is that mostly when those river freshwater foreign particles reach this salty ocean, that chemistry changes its behavior and cesium comes back off of the particles and enters the ocean. So there's some interesting chemistry going on and several studies and we'll look at how big that number is compared to groundwater in the slide after this. So somewhat unexpected here, we have a photograph of Yotsukura Beach. Uh, many of you might know that's about 35 kilometers south of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plants. And we went there to sample both the beach sands and the water underlying those sands, the groundwater. Now, how were they contaminated? Well, in 2011, those very high levels in the ocean would move underneath the beach and back out with the tidal currents. So you get a process, sort of like a sponge, you'd be absorbing cesium over time in the early days of 2011. So that would be the source of contamination for a location like this. What's interesting to us when we sample that is that the levels in the water were actually higher than the drinking water wells or rivers on the land side or the ocean side. So there's something about this brackish water that releases the cesium into the solution form that can then be transported offshore. And so the question really is how big is that source? So it's not dangerous at all to be here. Surfers still continue coming to this day. We can be there. But in fact, those levels in 2016 were in fact higher a meter below the surface here in the groundwater than at the reactor site itself. So high levels in groundwater, but the question is how big are they in terms of the amount coming per day, per year into the ocean? So let's go back to this early slide from the first speaker. We were measuring the fallout from the air and the direct discharge in terms of petabecquerels in those first couple of months. A becquerel, again, a small amount of radioactivity, but peta being a very big number, 10 to the 15, one with 15 zeros. And you add up to something like 20, 25, 30 petabecquerels coming out of that reactor site during the accident. Today, that reactor site releases something less than 0.01 petabecquerels per year, for an entire year. Rivers, about the same amount and this new groundwater source that we discovered, a very similar number. So the conclusion is that yes, there are three ongoing sources, the reactor site, rivers and groundwater, but they're relatively small. So getting to our last discussion, what's next? Well, there are concerns about water held in tanks on the site. There are over a thousand of these tanks, 1.2 million tons of water. And the focus has been on tritium and what would happen if we release that tritiated water. Tritium is a form of hydrogen, a radioactive form of hydrogen, which basically is the H molecule and H2O in water. So it's very difficult to remove and is built up in high levels in these tanks. My concern I just wanted to alert you to today is it's not just tritium that's in those tanks. A couple of years ago, TEPCO finally released data on other radionuclides in those tanks that are of values that are also high. 70% uh, of those tanks would have to be repurified, cleaned up before they could be released. And what this plot on the right shows is both the dose coefficient, how dangerous they are with tritium here on the left, very little concern with tritium, but these other isotopes are of greater concern health-wise. And then in light blue, how much they would concentrate in organisms like fish or in dark blue on the seafloor sediments. And you can see these numbers are much higher for these other radionuclides. So, while tritium might not be a concern, my opinion as an oceanographer is these other isotopes still are, and we would need to be removing them, the first point, and that is part of the plan that I've heard, but I've not seen that done yet. We would have to be uh, more details, independent analyses of each tank. These data so far only come from 200 of the tanks, and we'd want some independent monitoring, particularly in the ocean before during, and if they do release them, uh, of sea life 
seafloor uh, and seawater itself. So with that, I'll end here and take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ken, and uh, thank you over the years for all your help to the scientific community, as well as to um, one reporter who I know who's done a little bit of work in this regard. We do appreciate uh, your uh, desire to be forthcoming with the data and share it with the world. Uh, question from the audience. Uh, do you know how much radioactive material stayed near the reactor and how much was carried away by the currents? Well, it depends on the isotope. And thank you, Miles, and the audience for that question. Uh, because some of them, we focus a lot on cesium because it's more abundant. It moves primarily with those ocean currents that map I showed the animation. So in the case of cesium, to be more specific, more than uh, about 95, 97% would move offshore and a couple of percent would remain locally in the seafloor sediments. So that depends a bit on the chemistry in the ocean of each of the isotopes that's released. Something like tritium would move completely with the water. And as another example, things like cobalt uh, would be more locally uh, stored in the seafloor sediments. Laura has a, a follow-up question from the audience. Why do you focus specifically on cesium-137 instead of some of the other radionuclides? Well, you know, there's several reasons. One, it's more abundant. It was released at larger amounts. And analytically, it's relatively easy to measure. Uh, we also know from other studies, though, uh, we just didn't have time to show you all of the great collaborators I worked with in Japan and Europe who measure isotopes of iodine, strontium, uh, uh, plutonium. Uh, we measured tritium. So we do measure those other isotopes, but the indication that if you don't see the cesium, you wouldn't see the other isotopes. And there's a short-lived cesium isotope, 134, which only sticks around for about two years before half of it's gone. And so it's relatively easy also then to pinpoint with this fingerprint of the shorter form, half-life form of cesium, whether that water was contaminated by a, a Japanese source from 2011 or was already there. Because a lot of our problem is you got far away or even not that far away is telling what was there before and how much was added more recently. So cesium is a very good tool for that type of analysis. What you describe is a fairly complex picture. Uh, were there aspects of this that you did not expect? I think the biggest surprise was that uh, slide on the groundwater. You know, we went up and down. We were trying to study the ocean, but also the inputs to the ocean. So. Uh, with colleagues, Matt Charette, Virginie Sanyal, we were taking groundwater samples for several years and surprised at how high they were in the beaches when we sampled that water. And it took us a few years to kind of figure out that, okay, if the ocean was high in 2011 and moving by those beaches along the coastline, the tides move that water in and out under the sand, that the beach itself would be like a sponge. It would absorb the cesium and then slowly release it over time. And so we had a buildup from that initial release and this slow release. And so what was unexpected is that some of the highest levels uh, of cesium then in water were actually in that beach sand groundwater, what was underneath my feet about a meter and not at the harbor. Now, as I said, or I hope I said it was not dangerous to be there, but the question was how much is coming into the ocean. And that's important when you think of managing the situation. If you could completely make zero the input from the reactor, you'd still have rivers, as I talked about, and this groundwater. So it's kind of an important endpoint that we really didn't expect that that much of the release would end up associated you know, 60 miles, 100 kilometers to the north and 40 miles, 60 kilometers to the south with these localized beach sands. That was unexpected. Okay, have a lot more questions for you, including your best advice to the Japanese government in TEPCO uh, on what to do about those tanks filled with water, but we'll hold that for a moment until our panel section, uh, and let's move on for a moment. What do we know about how radionuclides affect marine organisms? It's a question many sushi lovers asked subsequent to the meltdowns. It's not a simple question to answer. It depends where the regulations are set and where the fish might be swimming in the sea. 
And it's a question that has a huge impact on an important industry in Japan. Convincing people that it's okay to eat seafood that comes from Fukushima waters remains a challenge. Our next speaker is a radio ecologist who focuses her work in this direction at France's Institute of Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety. Please welcome Sabine Charmasson. Thank you, Miles, and thank you, everybody, for joining the webinar. I am pleased to be here today to introduce you to the subject of marine biota and radioactivity. During my talk, I will first present the way biota uptake radionuclide, then deal with the situation in Fukushima, and say some words about the future needs. As it has been shown in the previous talk, radionuclide that has been released into the ocean can be formed either under dissolved or particulate form. Both can be uptaken by, by all marine organisms that live either in the water column or on the bottom. The uptake of radionuclide by biota involves uh, different uh, processes, such as absorption pro processes with adsorption onto the skin or absorption across the skin when radionuclides are incorporated into the body. Marine organisms can be contaminated also during ingestion, ingestion of seawater, food, and sediment for those organisms that live close to the bottom. And they eliminate radionuclide by excretion processes uh, that take place into gills or digestive system. Elimination and accumulation parameters are determined during uh, laboratory experiments. When an organism is placed into a contaminated environment, the concentration of this of uh, the radionuclides slowly increases in its body. At the beginning, uptake dominates, leading to fast accumulation of radionuclides, but gradually excretion takes place and the curve reaches a plateau when a dynamic equilibrium is reached. It means that uptake rates equal the excretion rate. There is then no more increase in concentration over time. And this value here is a concentration factor at this state. So, so, so concentration factors allow to know how much radionuclide a given organism can accumulate. And if it's greater than one, it means that there is bio accumulation. When the same organism is placed in to clean environment, its radionuclide concentrations progressively decrease, allowing to determine excretion parameters and to, def to determine the biological half-life. Biological half-life is the duration, it's the time required by an organism to lower by half its radionuclide body burden. This is an example of bioaccumulation experiments made on the shrimp and the algae with radiocesium. And you see that here with the shrimp, you have a nice plateau with its rich and you have the value of the concentration factor. And for algae, we have uh, to extrapolate until the, the value of 15 is reached. For fish, the average uh, concentration factor is around the 100 even if there can be some uh, variation between species, this gives the order of magnitude. This is an example of plutonium. Uh, plutonium uh, behaves uh, uh, really differently compared to cesium. And uh, as you see, you can have CF less than one for fish with intermediate value for invertebrates and very high value for plankton. So even if we don't eat phytoplankton or zooplankton, it should be kept in mind that they are the basis of the food chain. They are eaten by planktivorous fish, which in turn are eaten by carnivorous fish and so on. So concentration factor are parameters that are useful for radioecologists because they allow to compare, to compare the relative bioavailability of different radionuclide to a given organism. And in the same way, they allow also to compare ability of different organisms to accumulate a given radionuclide. 
as you have seen, uh, accumulation rates can vary depending on species and depending on the element. And this is exactly the same for uh, Africa. This slide gives an idea about how long it takes for radionuclide to cycle through fish. Cesium, which has been released in large quantity in, in, during the Fukushima accident, is uh, behave like potassium. So it goes mainly in muscles and organs, and it cycles through the body in terms of weeks or even months. If we take now into account uh, other radionuclides that have been released by Fukushima, you have tritium. Tritium is hydrogen, so it cycles within fish in terms of days, while strontium behaves like calcium. So it is taken up by in bones and it cycle in through the body in terms of years. So what was the situation in Fukushima? After the powerful earthquake and tsunami, many fishing boats were destroyed and due to the releases of radionuclide in the environment, fisheries were banned from March 15th. Provisional standards for consumer protection were established uh, first based on international standards. They were adapted to the Japanese uh, population and lowered down to 100 becquerel per kilo for radiocesium. Extensive monitoring survey has been set up uh, from the end of March 2011. And thousands of fish have been measured each uh, quarter, and the quarter is represented by a bar. The blue bar represent the fish that were below uh, the Japanese limit of 100 becquerel per kilo. When uh, the orange rectangle and the, the red number show the fish that were above this limit. You can notice that from 2015, there were almost no fish above this limit, except in late 2018. And recently, so it is not shown on this figure, Last week, also what's one other sample was found to be above this limit. In these two cases, these fish were fish living close to the bottom and they were caught off the coast of uh, the Fukushima prefecture. This slide is also representing some data about the monitoring survey, but they are presented prefecture by prefecture. And it concerns uh, demersal fish. That means fish that live in close connection with the bottom. Three striking features here. Yeah. The highest uh, contamination is found in off the Fukushima prefecture, which is expected. And the levels were quite high for the two first uh, year. And for a given date, there is a very uh, large range of, of uh, radionuclide concentration. This is partly due to the fact that we have mixed here several species. And as I showed you before, accumulation and elimination rates can vary depending on the species. And this is why the fishery management has been carried out species by species. But even for one species, for a given species, we can have difference between male and female depending on the size of its adults and juveniles. This slide shows uh, data from a survey carried out by a MAF and TEPCO concerning fish living in the water column of the mackerel family and the fat greening, which is a, fi a fish living close to the bottom. Here again, you have very high level over the two first years and then the decrease over time. It appears, it seems that with, with time, we have less and less samples, but in fact, it's mainly due to the fact that the contamination of the environment is decreasing. And so you have more and more samples that are under the detection limit and they are now represented here. But the main thing here is that the bottom fish living is presenting higher uh, level of uh, cesium compared to the fish living in the water column. And this is because these fish feed on prey living uh, on or inside contaminated sediment. It has been shown also that some species show very low metabolic rate. That is to say they have long depuration rates, so very long biological half life. Uh, details of this kind of study can be found in the poster session. So what are the future needs? For various species, season levels are still higher than they were before they were before the accident. And this has been shown in the previous talk 
are still continuous inputs from the from the site rivers and the groundwaters. But this mainly concerns species that live uh, close to the bottom due to the fact that the contamination of the sediment lasts for long. Survey sure must be maintained, but at level are decreasing, the detection limit should be lowered. And it might be better to have less sample but higher precision. And uh, I think this is an example of how studies carried out in the frame of expertise of control can feed the research field. And indeed, a huge amount of data were collected uh, since the accident, and they deserve to be looked at carefully to improve knowledge. But for this to be achieved, we need more information about fish size, if it's male, female, exact locations. Uh, fortunately, there are not many uh, sites like uh, the Fukushima site uh, in the world, and I should even say that this situation is unique regarding the marine environment. So in-depth feedback on the impact of radioactive releases on marine ecosystem and biota especially uh, is desirable and, uh, and necessary. Uh, as you have seen uh, in the previous talk, the situation on the site remains fragile and uh, it is necessary to stay on the alert in case of any new releases. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Sabine. We have a question from the audience, from Lani. Is there concern for radiation in big fish that migrate, like tuna, anywhere else in the Pacific? Um, thank you, Mike. Uh, I don't think there is a problem of radiation, but it's true that um, there, there has been a study, especially, and it is it is a, sp a study which is presented in the post session that has shown that some tuna that has been contaminated in Japanese water of Fukushima have migrated across the Pacific. But as they swam into clean sea water, they, they eliminate some uh, radionuclides. So the, the, the amount when they arrived uh, off uh, the coast of California was quite, were quite low, but it was a proof of uh, the migration of fish uh, across the Pacific. So sure, the, the fish don't move. Many fish move a lot on, on large scales. So it can be a way of transporting radionuclides. But I would should say that the transport by biota uh, is effective, but it's not as high as compared to atmosphere or current. What will it take, do you think, Sabine, for people to regain confidence in fish from Fukushima? This is a difficult question. In two words, I would say transparency and pedagogy. Simple as that. Simple as that. <laughs> I, there is some um, confusion about regulatory standards, and mm -hmm. I want to get into that when we get into our panel discussion. Um, people, I think, want zero, and zero is not necessarily a realistic number, but we'll talk about that in just a moment when we return for our panel. The issue of public confidence that Sabine refers to leads us very well to our next panelist. He has worked long and hard to employ candor and uh, transparency into the mix on all of this. And uh, unfortunately, not everyone sees the wisdom of candor and transparency. From the outset, the Japanese government and TEPCO stonewalled the release of information about the meltdowns, and that has persisted until today as it pushes to release tainted water from all those tanks. The truth is they really haven't learned their lesson. On 311, trust in the nuclear industry melted down as well. Our panelist is a leader of a grassroots organization that began almost immediately in the wake of the meltdowns. SafeCast has empowered people in Japan and now all over the world to become their own data collectors and truth tellers. Please welcome Asby Brown. Uh, thank you, Miles. Mina san, arigato gozaimashita. Dashi Asby Brown to Safecast. My name is Asby uh, Brown. I am this uh, lead researcher of Safecast. Today's theme is Fukushima as a crisis of trust. So that's the title I would like to touch upon today. Basically, on the 
the information transparency after the March 11th, and then there are the disinformation as well as this uh, uh, disinformation and social information uh, 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 needs and trust needs to be nurtured. There are lots of uh, scientific data. However, uh, despite the clear conclusion from the scientific data, many people do not believe that Fukushima marine products are safe to eat. Why not? That's a key point. Because in times of a crisis, people look for answers, but uh, uh, often they find uh, uh, lack of clarity and answer. There are lots of reasons. What we observed after the Fukushima, well, there are lots of information related to the information, unclear information. This is uh, the next uh, Ministry of Education's uh, data released on the 17th of March, 2011. It's so illegible. This is something submitted to the press conference for the lay persons. They can't really understand what they are talking about. And so there are lots of uh, unpublished data as well. This is uh, USDOE's released information because they have an aerial survey, reconnaissance uh, monitoring a flight to collect such data. So because of uh, the promise and the agreement with the Japanese government, Japanese government had the right to decide to publish or not, but the Japanese government uh, did not uh, publicize it for a long time. But quietly, USDOE released that information on its website, and Asahi newspapers reporter found it and published. People got shocked because uh, within the 20 kilometers, uh, the evacuation zone, uh, and beyond that, uh, the 20 kilometer the range, the major contamination was detected, especially uh, the Ichirishi Itate village. And this is unpublished data. So this is another issue of delayed information problem because the, these maps were released one after another, but uh, what about the Tokyo area, the uh, greater Tokyo area? Until December, the measured uh, radioactivity data was not released. It took so much time. And another issue is obscure information. This was the map by the NHK in April. You can see Mito area, Utsunomiya. And you see those uh, the dose uh, level in uh, handwritten way. But the mystery, Fukushima is somehow the uh, hidden here, covered up. Why they are not releasing Fukushima information? So there's another information. This is the uh, the uh, data by MAF, the Ministry of Agriculture and Forestry and Fisheries about the marine product test data. And this is uh, about October of 2012. It was a long at 34 pages. We scrutinized all the details, the name of the species of fish and whether the dose increased or uh, decreased. We couldn't identify. Maybe depending upon the species, it went up or down. It was too complicated, too complex. This is, uh, again, another information released uh, by the, uh, Dr. Bristler in his paper in science. And the same data was applied to analyze. And, and uh, the, according to each area and then the habitat, and then uh, according to each piece he has observed. But mostly there was a re uh, the reduction of this uh, uh, radioactivity. But uh, it was so easy to identify bottom fish accumulated more. And so uh, you can see the time. And, and maybe uh, you get the idea that uh, you should avoid the flanders and flatfish. But what about this misinformation versus disinformation? Maybe misinformation is just uh, the uh, simple mistake. But what about disinformation? It's intentionally done. Maybe you could call it demagogue. So uh, there are lots of uh, misinformation as well as disinformation after the March 11, especially social media talked about the disinformation. So uh, this is one of the examples. This map was released and media made a fuss about it, uh, social media as well. So this is, uh, they said, as the CCM uh, spread in the Pacific Ocean, so the Pacific Ocean is dead and all the, uh, the biota uh, were dead. But this is demagogue. It's not talking about CCM. Actually, this map talks about how the height of the tsunami affected, height of the tsunami, but the wrong information. This uh, disinformation was released to the public. So terrible thing is that uh, uh, you have to debunk such uh, information, but you debunk it and then this uh, kind of information is still released even today. So that uh, misinformation, disinformation are all mixed up. And there are the uh, reasons for this because uh, there's a lack of media literacy um, in our society. What kind of media is, is uh, trustworthy? 
what is wrong, what's correct, what's not correct. So maybe you have to educate the people from the, the primary school about this media literacy. This kind of issue relates to emotional component. People get upset, their anger, and they have uh, fear. And people rem remember this. And then you want to talk to other people. And there's a third one is a social component to your friends, family, and uh, your uh, the close friends and so on. You might uh, want to talk about that. Another one is the motivation. People who release such uh, the uh, disinformation are highly motivated. They might make money for money or maybe political reasons behind them and maybe just for joke or yucks but anyway they are highly motivated to release such a wrong information so because they are motivated and that's why they release such information the issue is that this kind of disinformation once you accept it it's so difficult among people to cooperate among themselves you have to have the, the, the sense of uh, the common understanding of the issue together in order to solve the problem therefore in crisis the scientists and technical need for information is often recognized but the social need is not there are lots of examples for example in this case you may be aware 2012 around april this kind of uh, thing was released. This is CCM in the food items, radioactive material, and the values or detected values. You know, in other words, the allowable limit for food has been lowered from 500 to uh, 100 becquerel per kilo. This sounds good, but uh, the recipients of information uh, reacted differently. Some people say, oh, I see, now it's safe. He's happy. The other people say, oh, now they are lowered this uh, allowable limit. So. Maybe it's uh, difficult to uh, the pass this uh, standard. Maybe there will be increase of food, which is not safe. What would you, people would want? Oh, that means it wasn't safe before. So, so why and to, for whom and for what are you releasing information? What will be reaction of all these recipients of the information that should be taken into account? Another major example. This is uh, the uh, the the tainted water uh, and treated water in accumulated in the Fukushima sites. And TEPCO and the government says that only tritium is there and that's the only problem. So they call it tritium tainted water. So after dilution that uh, you release it, but the uh, IAEA and other uh, organizations suggested and there was a consensus uh, that uh, the water should be released, but you need a society to cooperate, to understand it. So in 2018, in October, suddenly TEPCO uh, decided to admit that 84% of the, the treated water exceeded the release limits of the other materials, including the, the strontium-90 or cobalt-60. So this is as high as 84%. So people got shocked to hear this typical information. And then so the trust toward the uh, typical and government was damaged and lowered. And opposition was strengthened after this. There are lots of other issues around this. What are the other problems? For example, information was obscure, difficult to find and uh, uh, understand, incomplete, only partial, and no idea when the more uh, information will be available. The other issue is uninclusive, exclusive. This information is not intended for the public. And then uh, another one is a disappearance from the web. Web links broken or uh, dead or disappear. They're, it's uh, too noisy. Many people voice different things. So lots of information uh, is released. You don't know which voices to listen to. So after the uh, Fukushima, the globally, the global experts are talking about this issue, but communication issue is uh, something that you have to solve. And we thought that we solved the problem, but now we face a similar problem last year. It's a deja vu. After the corona pandemic, you identify the same kind of problem uh, reoccurred. Like uh, the, this is a, a bulletin of the atomic scientists, the journal, based upon what the Fukushima meltdown taught us about how to respond to coronavirus, communication problem, risk communication, the similar problems uh, reoccurred uh, the, after the corona pandemic. This most serious problem is, key issue is trust. Trust is not renewable resources. 
Once you lose it, never get it back. And then you require transparency. Without that, you cannot build trust and confidence. Transparency is crucial. Scientists might be institutionally most uh, transparent, but that kind of information uh, is uh, received by the government media. They might be used for the different purposes. It could be misunderstood. So uh, it's not intentional, but things fail and the failure occur. You have to understand that the communication failure should be avoided. You have to think it carefully. This is the end of my speech. I thank you very much for your attention. But anyway, please refer to uh, the uh, website, this uh, SafeCast. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Asby. And uh, as I uh, begin to ask uh, a couple of questions of you, I'm going to ask the remaining panelists to turn their cameras and microphones back on because we'll go seamlessly into our panel discussion. And uh, we would love the audience to continue your excellent participation as we do that. Asby, uh, what do you consider to be the most significant underlying cause of the trust slash communication problem post Fukushima? Hi. <laughs> Let me answer in Japanese. Uh, fundamental problem is the lack of preparation uh, for the Japanese government uh, 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 to react. Uh, because the nuclear power related accident. So evacuation plan and preparedness and uh, the drills and uh, and other the accident drills was not fully implemented. So after actually the accident occurred, they had to expedite. They had to prepare the standards, the limit and policies after the accident. But that lots of uh, uh, lack of the things and uh, insufficiency. That was a major problem lack of preparedness. The second is the toward the information um, communication. The social information provision was not fully understood, the need to information. They just were uh, saying something and then uh, re release information and they didn't think of how it was uh, they reacted or they perceived by the recipient of information. I still think that uh, had a bad impact even today. As be, uh as I look back 10 years ago, uh, the influence of social media was there, but not what it is today, of course. And uh, I'm very curious, as you draw parallels between what happened at Fukushima Daiichi and, and subsequent uh, response among people versus today in the pandemic, how different do you think things might have played out if uh, the meltdowns happen today in the social media environment we have today? Well, compared to the situation 10 years ago, it would have been uh, more uh, worse. Demagogue or the, the disinformation, and some people want to make use of it. They have a now high technology know-how, and they are quite quick to react those uh, disinformation providers. After the March 11th, the uh, globally different uh, research institutes, IAEA, and then the research institutes and the government, so on, they recognize the problem together. They organized the workshop to come up to the solution, ideas, options. They discussed and then came to a, a, a new solution. So the, there's a new thought as to how to focus on social media. One of the things is that uh, you have to release information the first, but the first uh, person who releases information wins. You have to, you can't wait one hour. You have to release information within 10 minutes. You have to talk to the experts. You have to depend on experts. The politicians will have uh, different roles. They just want people to feel relieved. Oh, we see problem, we take good measures, we think of you, so there will be no problem. Then now we will let you to listen to experts. That will be okay. If you depend on experts, all the problems can be solved. But at the time of Corona pandemic, lots of problems occurred. Some countries are successful, New Zealand and other countries. They, uh, at my home country, the US, suffered. The only political communication was released and like a 
politicians, uh, they, uh, they argued against experts. So the Japan did not release the misinformation, but you have to really have the good, reliable experts. So people didn't know whom to believe. You have to have a reliable experts to be on the front line. So social environment, environment dynamics are so different compared to that of 10 years ago. It's more complex, more complicated. So like if ever another nuclear power plant accident occurs, I'm really concerned, worried. You have to really be more skillful to give uh, more detailed information. Thank you, Asby. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that. I, the more recent earthquake made me think about what might happen uh, if we have a replay. A question from the audience, and this one is directed at all the panelists, but I wanna begin with Atsuku. Uh, you were, uh, Atsuku, I, I apologize. You were in Japan right after the events of 311 and uh, were in close proximity. Um, there wasn't a lot of good information available in those days, as we all recall, before we had things like SafeCast up and running. Uh, were you ever concerned about your own personal safety? Thank you for your question. Yes, I felt I had to go to Tohoku, but my family was so worried about me, about radiation exposure. So don't go to Fukushima was the message from my family. But I still had to go to find out how dangerous it was. And uh, the two earlier speakers said that at the time, information was so confused, especially in the US, I didn't know what was happening in Fukushima. I had to go there. If that's uh, dangerous, I have had to know how dangerous it would be for me as well. I had felt I had to experience it myself. Otherwise, you cannot use the effectively the uh, donated fund. I think there was a certain level of danger, yes. But the variable time must be used wisely and properly, I felt, as uh, the asb -San mentioned. Trust-based uh, philanthropy is a key word. Trust is the basis for the philanthropy. To gain a philanthropy, I had to practice, implement the spirit of philanthropy to gain trust, but I didn't really feel scared at all about danger at that time. Professor Kanda, you also were working uh, in waters right off of Fukushima, right after uh, the uh, events. Were you concerned? Well, I felt that the ocean was safer uh, compared to the other places because the radiation level was uh, much lower in the ocean. So I personally was not really concerned about my safety, but I didn't know what would happen because uh, I went too close to the nuclear power plant side. I didn't know what would happen. So I wore the protection equipment and clothes, but uh, later on, I felt I didn't need to put on this uh, protection uh, gear or the equipment at that time. Ken, same question to you. You were there very quickly afterward, uh, thanks to the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and that vessel which was chartered. Uh, what exactly um, was going through your mind? Well, Miles, uh, a couple of things. One, uh, the captain and crew, we were worried we, we make drinking water on ships, so could we process the seawater safely? In fact, we loaded up the drinking water tanks before we left Yokohama and we filled them. We went as far away as we had time. And then as we moved in, we could measure those levels. We had some further understanding that levels were not unsafe to be there. Uh, and something maybe unique to ships, but there was still a lot of debris a couple months later, you know, tree limbs, some submerged uh, reports of submerged containers. So we were actually worried about obstructions so that might damage our ship were we to run into them, physical damage. So. 
uh, the consequence of the tsunami was still with us there in terms of physical damage and what you could see floating on the ocean as well as the radioactivity that we were less certain about uh, at that time. Sabine, uh, a question for you about the regulations and the levels that are considered safe. I believe it is 100 becquerels per kilogram for fish. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. But I do know that those um, levels have changed. And uh, with good intentions, they create confusion, which actually might make people less confident in um, not only the regulations, but what they're actually eating. Um, help us understand how those numbers are arrived at and if, there's, if it's been a mistake to change them. Uh, thank you, Mike. In, in fact, it's, it's a difficult task in a way. Uh, the first level were based on international levels, which are currently used uh, of, uh, in the world. And uh, it's, true, it's true that the Japanese population is eating a lot of fish. So they decided to look at these uh, levels more carefully and they lower down to 100 becquerel per kilo. And this is true that it's, as as, be as, as uh, underlined, it's very difficult for the public to understand that. And they say, well, was it, was it safe before? Uh, and I think the 100 becquerel per kilo is very, very low, uh, and very low limit. And I think they also give this limit in order to, to have uh, confidence, confidence, to get confidence for the domestic supply. And uh, these numbers, in fact, they are uh, made, uh, they are estimated by uh, uh, taking into account how much, how much fish you eat per year and taking uh, the radiation dose uh, due to the, for example, mainly here the cesium, that is to say, you, you know, when you eat, uh, when you ingest uh, a radionuclide, it emits um, uh, energy that is absorbed in the tissue, and this is those. So, so sorry to be technical. So they take into account this, and they they get this number. But uh, it's true that's difficult always to say uh, before it was five five hundred, and now it's one hundred. But one hundred is really a low level. Aspie, on that point, uh, Safecast uh, did a, a really good job uh, scrounging the planet for. Um, radiation detection equipment and putting them in the hands of citizens. Um, just giving those uh, instruments to people without an um, understanding of what their uh, numbers mean, a little bit like handing a loaded gun to somebody and not training them in some respects. I'm curious if you had, uh, you and SafeCast uh, had a little bit of trepidation about that and how much have you been able to educate people so they understand what these numbers mean, which can be frankly dizzying for people who are not expert.
Professor Kanda, um, a question from the audience, and this comes from Frank. Is the Japanese government the prime funding source for the ongoing disaster research, or is it more an international effort? Thank you very much. The, for the Japanese researchers, the funding mostly comes from the domestic sources. Some of the funding sources come from the foreign uh, the, uh, uh, subsidies, but that's not a lot. So only some of the funding comes from other countries. Ken, I wanna to turn to you. Uh, we, we have a question from the audience. I wanna talk about the release of, of the water in a moment, but uh, Jolie asks, how severely was wildlife? Uh, and I, you know, I, I, I guess they're talking about on land or um, I'm not exactly certain. Is that something anyone has looked at? Do you know anything much about the overall picture of wildlife? Uh, I know you focus on, on the waters mostly. Yeah, our work and my colleagues is more on the marine side. I know there are scientists looking on land, trying to detect small changes, maybe genetic changes, reproductive changes in animals on land. I'm just less familiar. Uh, on, in the ocean, we don't see huge changes to, say, population level. Uh, fisheries uh, have recovered because of the lack of fishing. So in some ways, this is now become a marine protected area, you see some of the same responses, again, recovery. Uh, and if I could take a moment, because it's hard to do a Zoom panel, but just getting back to your funding question, uh, back in 2011, as an oceanographer seeking support for research off Japan, I was a bit disappointed. Uh, you mentioned the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation. Private funding is the only way we could do this, and later on, crowdfunding, individual citizens giving us $10, $20 at a time to run analyses. We did not have, and still do not have, a US federal program that would support ocean radioactivity research. So we, we kind of fall between the cracks in the US. It wasn't in our backyard. Yet I think we can argue, maybe making this a more open discussion here, but that with uh, reactors around the world draining into the ocean or situated on the ocean, we should have that expertise. I just happen to have been working long enough in this area that I could respond quickly, but that does take, I think, a standing body of, of research support to maintain that. So I think along with operations of nuclear power, we need the ability to measure these compounds on land and in the ocean and make predictions when things go wrong, such as 2011. Thank you. So, Ken, let's get to the question then uh, of the thousands of tanks that are there uh, and the surprise that uh, there's much more than tritium in them. Uh, TEPCO, uh, when I was there, spent a lot of time talking um, and touting this advanced liquid processing system, which was supposed to remove uh, everything except the tritium. And now we find out that's not the case. There's a lot more in there. So I guess it's kind of a two-part question. First of all, is it possible to remove all those other radionuclides? And then if you do still, if you are left with truly only tritium tainted water, what is the best course of action? Now that's a, a very good set of questions. I mean, I think we knew it was not a surprise to I think most any scientist that there would be remain isotopes besides tritium because the purification they use is never 100%. You know, you're 99% efficient. Uh, that still would leave levels of some of these more dangerous radionuclides uh, at concern. And getting to some of Asby's points, this gets back to transparency. It took almost eight years before they would admit to what we actually were saying, which is there's other things to consider that are 
one more dangerous in terms of their dose effects. So things like ruthenium, strontium, uh, cesium. And they're, as an oceanographer, their behavior in the ocean, as I touched, was quite different. They might accumulate to a much greater degree, as many of them do in marine life, in fish or on the seafloor. So any release won't move quickly with the ocean currents, but be retained locally. So over time could build up. So I think transparency comes to play to this day. I think I would love to see uh, more results in a very clear way. They, they release some numbers about 200 tanks. There's a thousand tanks. You know, if they're measuring 130,000 fish, they can certainly measure every tank and report concentrations, not just for nine isotopes, but all of the ones they can detect and that we know might be in those waters and put that in a simple form, each tank, the volume, the concentration. Uh, and now I think the second part of your question was about what to do about it. Tritium is extremely difficult to remove on this scale, 1.2 million tons of water. Uh, it's very difficult to move tritium from water. You don't want to just evaporate it because we don't want to inhale tritium, for example, as a consequence of evaporation removal processes. Uh, I put forward a simple calculation that it will take decades to clean up this area. And so if we continue to store in maybe improved tanks that are more earthquake uh, proof, that's done in petroleum industry, you know, after 50, 60 years, 97% of that tritium will just simply decay away. It might take more space, but no one's going to be building schools and factories and homes in the vicinity. There's open space around that site. So I don't think that should be the limit. And I at least think that should be considered because certainly natural decay will take care of the tritium issue. Recleaning, repurification will help us with many other radionuclides. So you put them through the system again. And I'd like to see them doing that reporting. In two years, I've not seen a big change in what they're reporting is still in the tanks. Start that today. Why wait? You know, the earthquake a few weeks ago as an example, let's start now removing these other more hazardous isotopes from those tanks. And so there's several things that kind of need to be done before I think you could even make the decision on what to do and is it okay to release this type of water to the ocean. We have a question now uh, to Sabine from Catherine. Apart from cesium, have other radionuclides been detected in the marine fauna near Fukushima? Uh, thank you. Um, as it has been underlined by Ken, there are, uh, cesium was, in, was the main radionuclide, radionuclide that has been released, cesium-137 and 134. But other radionuclides, such as strontium, also has been released, and it has been detected in some samples. But uh, it was also underlined that the analytical uh, uh, is more complex for the strontium, uh, explaining why we have less data. And, and in fact, also the cesium were far more, were releasing in uh, really higher quantities. But one uh, element which is uh, interesting is the silver 110. Uh, it's, it, uh, it has a short half-life of both less than one year, so it doesn't last for long, but it is really efficiently accumulated by biota. And I think the concentration factors are be in between 10,000 and 100,000 times the level that are in the seawater. And indeed, it has been de de detected, and I think Ken can correct me, I can say if I am correct, but I think in during his first cruise in June after the, the disaster, um, he was able to find some um, silver in plankton. And um, uh, it, it has also been, been detected in some fish, uh, but uh, only uh, during the 2011 and maybe uh, 2012 after it disappeared due to its short half life. But it's very efficiently accumulated by biota. Here's a question uh, for um, Etsuko, and I'd like to ask uh, Professor Kanda of, about this as well. Etsuko, I know um, one of your um, big priorities is to encourage more women leaders, uh, in, particularly as a, as a focus in the Tohoku region. Um, and um, the question is, are, are there enough 
female scientists in the mix here. Uh, but the broader question is, um, having women in leadership roles dealing with this is important, don't you think? Yes, thank you for the question. Of course, women should exercise leadership, which is very important, especially in case of Japan. In the world, according to the survey, of the 153 countries surveyed, unfortunately, Japan ranks only 123rd or 124th rank. So very low rank uh, compared to other countries. And recently, you know, another incident, former the Prime Minister, Mr. Mori uh, made a, a statement. He used to be the chairman. He was the chairman of the Japanese Olympic Committee. He made some words uh, which uh, sort of disregards the uh, uh, power of women and society criticized him and he had to step down. He resigned from that position. But women's voices here uh, might not be really listened to the government or the enterprises here. So finally, even in Japan, that is happening and change is being felt. And the women in Fukushima had been uh, raising the voices in the last 10 years. And even today, those women leaders in Fukushima and the area are raising voice. I'm not a scientist. So I don't know exactly about the Japanese scientists' position or their leadership. I don't know the exact statistics on women scientists. But in terms of social sector as well, women are so less, very few women in the leading position in social sector probably in the scientific world, academic society, among the scientists in Japan, we might have a, a less number of the Japanese women leaders compared to other countries. But the world in the future, science will be more and more important. So Japanese education for the young women, the girls, maybe in the past, the, the physics and the, the, all the, uh, the science and uh, uh, math uh, used to be the subjects only for boys. But I think we should change that the mindset here in Japan. Thank you for your uh, the question. And did I answer you properly, I hope? Absolutely. Professor Kanda, I would like you to pick up on Atsuko's statements there. Uh, what is being done in Japan in the research community to encourage more women to take leadership roles as scientists? Unfortunately, among the Japanese researchers, scientists, that's true that uh, limited, only a limited number of Japanese uh, uh, scientists are women we need to raise the percentage of women, even in our society, as well as the uh, research institutes of universities, we are making efforts to try to increase the women researchers. What is most important here is that the women should be interested in the natural science and choose the uh, career path to become a researcher. That's the most important thing. At the same time, we have to prepare the environment, background, where the women can feel comfortable to keep working as a scientist. And we, on behalf of the academy and as a researcher, we like to continue to make efforts. Here's a question for Asby. Uh, it is hard to trust uh, experts for us since we think many uh, rumor and fake information were released by so-called experts or government sources. What could you suggest to build a better communication between us, that is to say the general public in Japan and people who conduct science. Uh, again, I'll, I'll answer in English. Um, the, the crisis after 311, uh, it was a multiple crisis. Of course, trust was lost by government. People stopped trusting government. People stopped trusting media and people also stopped trusting scientists. And one of the reasons for that was there were scientists who were basically brought out as spokespeople uh, by go Japanese government who, who really ended up not being as reliable as they should be. 
uh, and people found it uh, that they had to dismiss science as a whole, uh, you know, in, in order to try to find better information. This is really a disaster for science, for the scientific community, as it was a disaster for for the the mass media. Uh, it's, um, I mean, it, it's one thing to to try to uh, help scientists understand the need to develop good communication for the general public. Uh, and I think this event is a very good example of that. I'm very happy with the kind of communication we're seeing. I'm very happy to talk with someone like uh, Dr. Bissler uh, because he does this very, very well. Um, and I think I'll point out your role, uh, Miles, as a, a science journalist um, really is, is very unusual these days. There's not many science journalists left. People who have the background or are willing to do the research and the homework uh, to to know what to ask and to know when they're being uh, told something plausible and when they're not. Uh, so this is a really systemic problem we have. Uh, I think um, any government is likely to find convenient scientists to say whatever it is they want them to say. And we saw this in the case of coronavirus, certainly in the United States, uh, with you know uh, better experts being sidelined and worse or less reliable uh, experts being given the opportunity to to talk to the public. And this is really a problem. So it's a very multiple pr problem. I encourage scientists to uh, learn uh, how to speak to media. And um, I think many institutions, uh, research institutions and uh, uh, educational institutions uh, do now provide some training and advice to, to scientists about how to speak to media, media. I think it's very, very important. At the same time, I think media also use, needs more training to talk to scientists. Uh, and again, because we're just seeing this general uh, budgets decrease and Often it's the science journalists who are the first to be let go. So it's a very complicated problem. Um, we now have, again, throughout the world, and we saw this a lot through coronavirus, um, anti-science uh, movement that's sort of taking over many countries. And certainly it's happening in the United States where people are just, they don't wanna believe anything, but they will believe the latest spiritual, um, some kind of uh, fantasy or, or some kind of what we might call some kind of superstitions. Um, and and a, a great example was um, uh, during the coronavirus, uh, you know, when it was breaking out last year, I was contacted by a good friend, very well-educated person who said uh, they were glad they were leaving Japan because the 5G system was going to start operating in Japan. And 5G, of course, is what causes coronavirus. Uh, and and I, my head exploded. I thought, how could you believe that? And that person gave me a video to watch and I realized they were very susceptible to that kind of uh, disinformation. And, and this, this, you know, uh, this video spread throughout the world. So um, this is a real problem. How do we train people, educate them from when they're very young, one, to understand enough science that they can make sense of how things work, and two, to understand media? Uh, to know when they're likely being lied to or when something's more reliable. Uh, it's a big problem and it's getting to be a real crisis now. And we see how that has played out in politics and things uh, in the US as well. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Asby. You know, as you were speaking, I was thinking about that, that uh, map that was completely misinterpreted uh, showing the uh, actual impact of the tsunami height of the ocean and being interpreted as uh, radiation spreading across and, and, you know, kind of destroying the Pacific. And, and no matter how many times we debunked that, it would come back. It was just like a bad penny. And uh, which leads me to a question from the audience for Ken. Let's just clear this up once and for all. Uh, there are people out there, Ken, who wonder if the radiation from Fukushima has made its way into the, the Atlantic or even the Mediterranean. Do we have any evidence of any kind of spread like that? And even if we did, would it be consequential at all? Well, we certainly uh, tried. The first thing scientists do is look locally. I was in Woods Hole with an air tower trying to see that atmospheric delivery. And indeed, we saw a small amount reaching the east coast of the US. But by the time it got in the ocean, I would sample the ocean, you could not detect those amounts with the most sensitive equipment that I had, no increase. Now, by the way, that contrasted with uh, Chernobyl in 1986, where we saw the cesium levels off of Whistle double. That radioactivity went all the way around the world. It was high enough 
that by the time it got to us, you could still measure it in the ocean. But we don't see contamination uh, to what we could measure in the Atlantic, which would also imply in the Mediterranean from Japan. And, you know, I, I think this, I do want to get back to the last question. It's hard to have a panel when we're on Zoom and we're all looking at little screens here, but, you know, the public trust of getting science information out there in forms people can digest. I think that was a lot of the challenge I saw where Japan was very open, unlike after Chernobyl, producing results. But if you have sheets and sheets of, of numbers that aren't put in a graphical form to measure relative levels, how can you ever tell the public that the fish are getting higher or lower, which fish? So a lot of our job is to translate that. And then I think uh, ASB also didn't bring in like safe cast model and our crowdfunding as I found more, I won't say to my surprise, but I was glad to see that once people get engaged in collecting those samples, assisting you as a scientist to measure seawater at their favorite beach, to bring you a sample. I know in Japan, people bringing their, their meals for analyses. Then I think they get more engaged in wanting to know what that means. They actually have a better interest than just hearing some rumor that all the fish may have died in the Pacific, which is completely untrue uh, because of radioactivity. So I think the challenge moving ahead is getting information out without being dismissive of concerns, even when it's low, but also not trying to alarm people unnecessarily uh, when they are not in harm's way. So uh, I think those are important lessons here after 10 years. And I do see a few other hands now going up. Maybe we'll get a little dialogue here uh, with that. So that's mostly what I had to say uh, to the, your question and then a comment after. Thank you. As usual, uh, Ken, you're provocative. Uh, let's begin with uh, Sabine and then we'll go to As Asby. Go ahead, Sabine. Yes, it, it was just to come back to the Europe uh, situation. In fact, uh, uh, Europe is far from Pacific and the releases were fortunately very diluted. And the first uh, detection of iodine in the atmosphere was around one week later than the accident. And um, this lasts about uh, 10 to 15 days. And two peaks were observed in late March and beginning of April. And some very few um, a low level of cesium were detected on land. And I was personally involved in collecting samples in the Mediterranean Sea. And a very small amount of iodine were found in some muscle samples, but we were not uh, able to detect uh, cesium-134. And uh, there was no, no iodine, no cesium-134 on, on, in seawater. So it was really, really low. All right, Th thank you for clearing that up, Sabine. Asby, go ahead. I just wanted to uh, add a little bit to what Ken was pointing out, um, and and also the, one of the com one of the Q and A questions from the audience actually also sparks this. Uh, scientists, you know, one of the biggest challenges for scientists is to uh, communicate in situations of uncertainty when you don't have a clear 100% firm answer, but you can only say, well, this is more likely or this is less likely, and this is why. These, these are questions of judgment. And, and again, the general public, uh, you know, most of us as human beings, we don't function well under uncertainty. We wanna know yes or no, safe, unsafe, you know? Uh, and, and to try to help people understand that even though you don't know everything, uh, you know, you can still make determinations and, and make decisions about what to do based on the information, the incomplete information that you have. And as we saw after Fukushima, there was only incomplete information. There was no complete information about anything. Uh, and over time, over 10 years, we know a lot more about a lot of things like the ocean, et cetera. But in the first weeks and months, there were only questions that needed to be answered. So this is a big problem. And I think uh, maybe education can help with that. But I think communication and, and taking the time scientists to listen to people and also, as Ken was pointing out, and uh, you know, participation makes a lot of difference. Participation uh, is a kind of education. It is hands-on training and learning about something that matters to you personally. Uh, and through that, you find out 
what the questions are. You learn, you get a sense of what do you know very well? What do you not know very well? And this is a very important experience. So I want to encourage people to, to um, foster and support, you know, citizen science and, and, and encourage young people and old people, of all stripes to, to participate in, in citizen science projects. All right, we're getting close to running out of time. Just if we could do this, I'm gonna try this. Hopefully everybody can see everybody. By a show of hands, I wanna ask our panelists, are they comfortable eating Fukushima fish? Uh, raise your hand if the answer to that is yes. Okay, we've settled that. Now, I just wanna get some closing thoughts and we'll circle it all around. We'll start with Otsuko. Um, I need you to make a prediction. Um, when we hold this um, event 10 years from now on the 20th anniversary, and we'll all be here uh, and uh, we will look just the same. And when we do that, um, what do you predict we'll be talking about? Thank you for your question for women and philanthropy, that's the area I would like to focus. In the upcoming 10 years, I would like to monitor and focus on Japan in the upcoming 10 years. Things should change, improve even in Japan, world is changing. Uh, in the 75 years so during the post-war era, Japan is now heading toward a new era, especially after this terrible era of corona pandemic. So. 10 years ago, we suffered from the major earthquake and disaster. Now, coronavirus pandemic and Japanese people will learn a lot of things through that uh, experiences. We empower. And, and the children today should learn more about the science and math. So we shouldn't uh, uh, distinguish between the boys uh, and the girls. We should nurture the people, the young people who will contribute to the world. And that's something they should choose as a subject for uh, their study. And I'm sure Japan will be a lot better place than today, 10 years from now. Thank you for your question. I like the optimism. Kanda-san, what is your prediction for 10 years from now? May I talk about philanthropy as well? Philanthropy is important. In Japan, of course, we have the politi politics and the administration, government, and the, uh, the companies. I think the other people there should play the important role as well uh, for the sake of philanthropy. OK. Uh, Professor Kanda, if uh, you could look into the future for us and tell us what you predict we will be talking about in 10 years' time. I agree what the, the, the Toko said, that I believe that Japan would be better. There are lots of challenges. Why the women scientists and researchers are not increasing in Japan? I want the women to be interested in science. Maybe that gave you some strong impression. So that uh, is the assumption that the Japanese uh, women researchers and scientists are not in the environment to feel comfortable to keep uh, studying because Japanese society uh, is uh, difficult. It's not yet uh, the, uh, to uh, promote women uh, to keep working as a scientist. We have to improve it. And then as Toko suggested, both boys and girls, the men and women, should be able to be engaged in the research and uh, science. So we should nurture a good environment, conducive environment for them to keep working. Then we have to learn a lesson from Fukushima and then should be applied to uh, the future policies. And I have optimism in that. Professor Sharmasong, uh, if you would uh, give us your uh, peek into the future, and I will remind you, you are muted at the moment. Thank you. So in 10 years, I, I hope we will have drawn the lessons from this uh, disaster and uh, take advantage of this uh, disaster to understand better 
uh, the, the fate of uh, radionuclide in the environment and uh, the effect on the marine biota, for sure. That I think is the main things. Ken Bissler, what does your crystal ball show you? Well, Miles, uh, I think the, the key thing that we'll be talking about still is, is it safe? Those three words that will always be asked. And I say that so strongly because I was recently in the Marshall Islands where 75 years ago we were testing nuclear weapons. Three generations later, they're still asking that same question. What are the levels in the ocean? What are the levels in the seafood they're eating? So there will be prediction. I know there will be residual radioactivity from Fukushima. Let's hope there's not a another accident at that site or nearby where we're talking about additional radioactivity because it's that we would not want to see. But I think the question be with us because it is a, a risk. There's any additional radiation causes potential human health risks. And so we just have to keep monitoring that, be cognizant of what's there and keep trying to address those concerns by independently assessing these uh, ocean levels. So is it safe? We'll, Come back in 10 years. I hope you're here and talking to me about that same type of question. Thank you. I'm, I'm putting it in my calendar right now. Anything for you, Ken. All right, Asby, <laughs> final thoughts. Uh, looking toward the future, please. Uh, I'm actually optimistic about a lot of things. Uh, I'm seeing already uh, good uh, efforts and, and movements happening on the social side in Fukushima. Uh, we're seeing finally a great wealth of scientific data to help us understand the situation. Uh, I think in 10 years, a, a lot of uh, long-term experiments will have some uh, answers to some things that require monitoring over this, the scale of decades, because we know um, the half-life of cesium-137 is 30 years. Uh, this problem is going to be with us for, for many, many decades. Uh, I, I, guess, I guess I'm most optimistic about um, people that I've met in Fukushima who uh, refuse to give up, who are visionary, who know things will never go back to the way they were, but who see the possibility for creating new viable communities, new types of uh, experimental information-based agriculture, new types of uh, small localized businesses, new types of energy production. I see a lot of this stuff happening in Fukushima. Uh, it's kind of gotten to a point where there's enough people trying those things that maybe in 10 years, we'll see a really very changed uh, social, economic, and technical uh, landscape there. Uh, at the same time, I don't want to uh, try to diminish the, the challenges. These challenges are great. It's, it's a hard place to live. Uh, and, uh, you know, the influence that it has on the rest of the world is, of course, something we have to keep in mind, too. But I want to be optimistic. Don't we all? Asby, uh, thank you. Thank you to the rest of our panelists. That is all the time we have. Uh, your, your insights were fantastic. What a great conversation. And also special thanks to Atsuko Toko Fish for participating as our keynoter. And I want to thank everybody online who joined us. Great questions. We will repeat this event in English at 7 p.m. Eastern time. That's midnight GMT, 9 a.m. tomorrow, Tokyo. You can register for that event by going to the URL on the screen. Joining us uh, will be the same set of panelists, but our keynote speaker will be Caroline Kennedy, former U.S. ambassador to Japan. I also want to remind everyone to take a look at the virtual poster session to learn about the most recent research related to Fukushima Daiichi. You can find it by going to the same page and clicking on the virtual poster session icon at the top of the page. Each poster includes audio recordings in Japanese and English describing the research. In addition, on March 24th, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution will hold another virtual event to look at natural and human-caused radiation in the ocean and in the environment all around us. Dr. Ken Bissler will appear at the event as well. Joining him will be Dr. Shaheen Duji from Texas A&M University and Rio Morimoto from Princeton. That will be from 7 to 8 Eastern time on March 24th, and it's part of the popular Ocean Encounters virtual series. 
What a great session. I really enjoyed being a part of it. I'm Miles O'Brien. On behalf of the team that organized this, and it wasn't an easy thing, thank you for joining us.